a really warm welcome to everybody here. We all know we're on Aboriginal land and we respect their elders past and present and those to come. I remember talking to Noel Pearson a while ago and he said, only people who have felt discrimination really feel the evil of it. And I think most of us are here tonight because we know the evil of discrimination. And there's always somebody somewhere wanting to take our freedom away. My name is Reverend Bill Cruz and I'm from Sydney and I'm really honoured to say I'm a good friend of His Holiness, a good friend. He calls me a good Buddhist and I call him a good Christian. <laughs> and we meet somewhere in the middle, somewhere between Nirvana and heaven. That's where we meet. And I'm really honoured to be here I'd actually walk over broken glass to come to here. I was in Dharamsala, I think, about two months ago. And to see what's happened there and to see the, the change and the, the hope that's there is just mind-blowing. And there's nothing more powerful than an idea. Nothing. There's nothing more powerful than the idea of freedom and to be who you want to be. Nothing more, more strong than that. And people say, oh, but look at the Chinese government. They've got all the planes, they've got all the military, they've got all the buildings, they've got all of that. But freedom is like the wind, you know? Freedom blows where it blows and those who hear it, hear it. And so I'm really honoured to be here tonight to be part of this great meeting. And first of all, I'd like to welcome Michael Danby, who has been a, a good friend of, of Tibetan cause for a long time, just to say a few words. So let's say hello to Michael. Uh, Reverend uh, Weeks, uh, as, uh, Master of Ceremonies, uh, Sikyong, welcome guests to Australia, uh, venerable monks, uh, friends from the Tibetan community and friends of the Tibetan community like me. I want to tell you I've been with His Holiness's uh, uh, political leader, uh, the Tibetan community's democratically elected uh, leader, the Sikyong, in Canberra this week. And you should be filled with pride at um, the Sikyong and what Dr Lopsong Sange has done in Canberra. Tomorrow night on ABC 24, uh, I think at 6 o'clock, certainly at 9 o'clock on Sunday night, you can see his address to the National Press Club. Um, and I've been to the National Press Club many times. It is one of the most um, vital, um, inspiring speeches I've ever seen. I urge you to watch ABC 24 tomorrow and have a look at it. But I want to tell you, especially to our Tibetan friends who are far from home and whose peaceful, non-violent struggle for His Holiness's vision of the middle way may seem very far away, that um, uh, Professor Sangai has represented you in a brilliant way to uh, various forums in the parliament, including... Um, a meeting of the Parliamentary Friends of Tibet. And we were honoured there to have um, our friend, a minister in the Liberal Party, uh, our first um, Indigenous member of uh, the Cabinet, and to have uh, a member of the Labor Opposition Shadow Cabinet too. So some people have courage to be associated with the Tibetan cause. Um, and we do it because we understand the beauty of Tibetan culture, 
the beauty of the underlying Buddhist culture that it's based on, and because of uh, the gentle and non-violent way you pursue uh, the just struggle to express your religion, to speak your language in your own homeland. And the fact that um, here in Australia we can see the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, but you can't see him in Hassa and in Tibet is a great shame. And um, as Mr Shorten said to the gay community, I want to say to you that many of your political friends say to the, our friends in the Tibetan community, you are not alone. Um, there are people like me and others all over the world who are with you. Um, and we will keep staying with you, um, working with uh, uh, Professor Sangai, the Sikyong, um, to advance the cause of Tibetan autonomy, uh, to see that uh, people uh, in Tibet are justly treated by the Chinese authorities and that the oppression doesn't continue. I want to tell you from the many parliamentarians in Parliament House um, that there is a lot of support for the people of Tibet. We welcome the fact that there are about three or 4,000 Tibetans here in Australia now, including in Melbourne, and uh, we are your friends. We will be with you until um, Hassa is liberated from uh, the oppression that it uh, faces. Many people around the world, and I want to pay tribute finally to um, all of the, the people in the Tibetan Information Office, in the Tibetan community, and particularly to our visitor, uh, the democratically elected Prime Minister in exile of the Tibetan people, Lopsong Senge. Thank you. I was given two introductions, a long one and a short one, and I thought, I'll take the short one, but it's half a page. And out of respect, I'm going to read the whole lot, and there'd be many people here who, who don't know. Dr. Lobson Sangay was born and grew up in a Tibetan settlement near Darjeeling, where he attended the Central School for Tibetans. He completed his BA with honours and law degrees from Delhi University. In 1992, he was elected as the youngest executive member of the Tibetan Youth Congress. In 1996, as a Fulbright Scholar, he obtained master's degree and in 2004, the first Tibetan ever to receive such a degree from Harvard Law School. And his dissertation, Democracy in Distress, Is Exile Policy a Remedy? A Case Study of Tibet's Government in Exile was awarded the Yong K. Kim 95 Prize in 2005. He, in 2005, he was appointed as a research fellow and promoted to senior fellow till early 2011. Dr. Sange is an expert on international human rights law, democratic, democratic constitution and conflict resolution. He has spoken in hundreds of seminars around the world. He organised seven major conferences among Chinese, Tibetan, Indian and Western scholars, including two unprecedented meetings between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Chinese scholars in 2003 and 2009 at Harvard University. In 2007, he was selected as one of the 24 young leaders in Asia by the Asian Society and a delegate to the World Justice Forum in Vienna, Austria, where top legal experts and judges from around the world congregated. In 2011, he was elected to the post of Katon Tanja in the unprecedented com competitive democratic election in the Tibetan di diaspora on August 8, 2011. During the swearing-in ceremony, his Holiness the Dalai Lama said, when I was young, an, uh, an elderly regent handed over 
political leadership to me. And today I am handing it over to young Lobsang Sangay. In doing this, I have fulfilled my long cherished goal. Who else would give up power? How many people give up power? Not many, most cling to it by their fingertips, don't they? Dr. Sangay was a, appointed President of Central Tibetan Administration for a second time in 2016. So let's welcome Dr. Sangay. Go on, stand up, he deserves it. <laughs> thank you, thank you. My next guest, I've only got a few lines, Professor John Powers. Professor John Powers is research professor at Alfred Deakin Institute of Deakin University. Please, welcome. <laughs> Let the dialogue begin. Thank you very much. Well, firstly, welcome everybody. Uh, this is quite a crowd, and uh, welcome to Sikong Lopsung Senge. It's good to see you again. I first met him about uh, maybe 10 years ago when I lived in Canberra. Uh, shortly after he had been elected, it was very nice to see him, and I was very impressed by his uh, erudition and his insights into Tibet. So I assume that he's probably gained even more insights now. So we're going to be talking uh, about some of the important things that are happening in Tibet right now, and the main goal will be to draw him out on what his insights are into what's happening in Tibet on important areas like uh, religion, politics, the environment, the economy, and human rights, and so forth. So that's what we're going to be talking about. So uh, first of all, the thing that I'm particularly interested in is Tibet's environment. Uh, not many people know that Tibet is actually ground zero for climate change. And Tibet's rivers supply 85% of the water, 85% uh, of the populations of Asia with water. And the glaciers that feed these rivers are shrinking at three times the global rate. The temperatures are rising faster on the Tibetan Plateau than anywhere else on Earth. And the Chinese government uh, is doing things that are very negative. That is, most of their policies are going to exacerbate the situation, including diverting huge amounts of fresh water to interior China. Uh, and nobody's really talking about this very much. So I'm hoping that you can talk about it a bit. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, uh, you know, for hosting me and all of you for coming uh, today. Um, I'm a bit relieved and anxious uh, given the uh, person who's sitting next to me because he's a professor himself. He knows Tibetan Buddhism, he knows about Tibet, Tibet's environment, all that. So I'm relieved because if I make any mistakes, he will correct it. <laughs> But I'm anxious because if I make a mistake, he will actually correct it. So, so far from Sydney to Canberra to Melbourne, I was getting by because no matter what I say, no one can correct me. But so I'm here sitting next to a professor. So I hope this will be more a partnership than an investigation or interrogation, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, you know, Tibet's environment is vital uh, for, you know, for Asia and for the whole world, actually. Uh, Tibet is called the third pole. After Antarctica and Arctic, Tibet has the third highest reserve of ice. The difference is Antarctica and Arctic, when they melt, it goes to ocean. But as far as Tibetan glaciers are concerned, when they melt, it forms rivers. And then 1.4 billion people in Asia are dependent on water flowing from Tibet. So it's very important. And as you rightly pointed out, some environmentalists and scientists have said that in the last 100 years, the glaciers of Tibet have disappeared. Half the glaciers of Tibet have already disappeared. Now, according to NASA, based in US, by 2100, the, of the remaining 46,000 glaciers, another 50% will disappear. Now, if that happens, then there will be a major crisis of river or water in Asia, particularly, China has 19% of the world population, but only 12% of fresh water, which means already China is facing around 400 or million people are facing water scarcity in China. 
The situation in uh, India is worse, Bangladesh is worse, and also in Pakistan. Now, if you name, you know, some of the rivers like Indus and Satlash, starts from Tibet, goes through Kashmir to Pakistan, Brahmaputra, which is a lifeline uh, for northeast of uh, India and also Bangladesh, uh, Mekong River, Irrawaddy River, uh, all flow from Tibet, Yangtze River, Yellow River of China, also all flow from Tibet. Hence, 1.4 billion people in Asia are dependent on rivers flowing from Tibet. Hence, Tibet is vital. Now, some Chinese scientists included, and uh, Canadian and Americans have also said that Tibet acts like a cooler for the whole world. The jet stream over Tibet affects the climate all the way to Latin America. The heat wave in Europe that you see now, that some people in Europe are complaining about, has something to do with uh, Tibetan plateau. Uh, also, the heat wave in northeast of China has something to do with uh, Tibetan plateau. So, including Australia. I have read uh, a Canadian environmentalist saying whether the temperature in Canada will be cooler or warmer is partly dependent on Tibetan Plateau. So a well-known environmentalist, if, in fact I've written an article in The Guardian for audience in Canada, if you, if, audience in Australia, uh, if you read that then I have uh, listed all the reasons why Tibet's environment is important. The, uh, the, the scientists in California said that unless you understand the Tibetan plateau, you won't get the full picture of climate changes and global warming. So Tibet is vital as far as global uh, environment is concerned and as far as Asia is concerned, for as far as uh, water is vital. And, and there's also an Australian connection too. The, uh, I told you he's an expert, yes. yes. <laughs> so he will make the Australian connection, yes. The southern monsoon uh, that uh, begins in, in glaciers in western Tibet, and the monsoonal patterns follow Tibetan rivers, particularly the Yalong Sangbo, and then uh, the monsoon continues on and it ends up in northern Australia, where it supplies water that's used for irrigation, for farming and so forth, and it peters out in, in the Australian outback. So all of this starts in Tibet, and all, all these weather patterns also affect the El Nino and La Nina patterns, which determine weather patterns here in Australia and around the world. And very little is actually being done about this. Uh, th there's, there's very little research on this, and there's very little awareness of just how important this global situation is. Mm. And recently, some uh, Chinese environmentalists have also recommended to the Chinese government, uh, saying that Tibet should be designated as third pole national park because Tibet, Tibetan Plateau is very fragile and very delicate. We have to protect the Tibetan, the Tibetan Plateau for the sake of China and for the sake of Asia. If Chinese government leaders don't want to listen to you and me, at least they should listen to Chinese environmentalists and scientists who see how uh, important Tibet is. Unfortunately, because of industrialization, mainly mining of Tibetan minerals, Tibet is rich in minerals. I don't know if someone has collected data, maybe you might say. Uh, Tibet is very, uh, around 123 different kinds of minerals are there in Tibet. Gold, copper, borax, uh, you name it. And all these are exploited by a Chinese company uh, without due regard to environment, without being sensitive to Tibetan culture, because there are sacred mountains and sacred rivers, even there are mined and you know, dams are built on rivers. So it's affecting. Uh, the Tibetan climate, and hence even Chinese environmentalists have recommended that uh, Tibetan plateau be protected uh, so that, you know, Chinese people in China and Asia can enjoy uh, and can sustain uh, the river flow and also the climate changes. And that's a very important point too, that uh, a lot of the work that is being done in China with respect to the environment doesn't take into account indigenous knowledge and indigenous people. So one of the things that the Chinese government is doing now in order to protect the grasslands is they're moving the, the Tibetan nomads off of the grasslands. And this is actually, it sounds, they say that they're doing it to protect the grasslands, they're trying to keep human people, human uh, 
uh, effect on the grasslands to minimize that. But the problem is that it's a similar situation to what you have in Australia. That is, in the past, the indigenous owners of the land uh, controlled the land. They, they, uh, they started fires to protect the environment and so forth they, and manage the environment. And the Tibetan nomads for millennia, for thousands and thousands of years, have been moving across these grasslands. They've been managing the grasslands. And when you move them off of that, that actually creates environmental problems because that land is not pristine land. It's been managed by people for thousands and thousands of years. When you remove the people from the equation, it creates a lot of problems because of the vacuum that the people used to, uh, used to fill. Um, I organize, as, as Bill uh, you know, suggested in my introduction, I've organized several conferences between Chinese and Tibetan scholars at Harvard. So I had a, you know, a participant from Tibet. Uh, he had a nomadic background. And he said, for hundreds and thousands of years, Tibetan nomads have used their grassland quite wisely because their livelihood depended on the grassland. So they managed it for hundreds and thousands of years. Suddenly, Chinese experts come and say, no, you should move away from grassland because you are you know, harming the grassland. So why would I harm my own grassland? Because that's my livelihood. So as per Human Rights Watch is concerned, they have come out with a report. I think it's estimated around a million Tibetan nomads are forcibly removed from nomadic area and taken to nearby urban areas and put them in a ghetto-like places. So they're given a compensation for a few months, up to a year or so, and after that they have to make a living on their own. Now how can a nomad, you know, brought down from the mountains, which they, they have been living for hundreds of years, brought down to an urban area and told them to you make a living on your own? They don't have skills, they don't have know-how, they don't know how to adjust in the urban areas. Hence, they are you know, without employment and the drugs and all kinds of uh, you know, uh, lives, their lives are very badly affected. So, you know, Human Rights Watch report, a million nomads are moved from mountains to the towns and cities of Tibet. Now, what happens with this grassland? Minerals exploitation. So Chinese company come, extract minerals, and then who benefits? The Chinese company, the local Chinese official pocket, the rest of the money, and the Chinese employees. The workers are also Chinese. So hard Tibetan nomads and Tibetan locals hardly benefit anything uh, from the mining that's taking place in Tibetan areas. It's true, and it's hard to really describe just how fragile most of the Tibetan environment is. Mm -hmm. When you go there, uh, Say, for instance, the, the hillsides have a very small bit of soil and it's held together by very densely packed uh, lichen and, and ground cover. And a lot of that is being removed. So uh, one of the things that I saw everywhere I went was the, the, a lot of the major highways follow the rivers, which is the, the natural place for, for a highway. And they're being expanded uh, tremendously now by the Chinese government. And so you'll see 12, 13, 14 earth movers all tearing down the hillsides. And all of this uh, uh, ground covering that has grown up over the course of centuries is being torn away and it's leaving, of course, gravity to pull down the rest of the hillside and all this is being dumped into the rivers. So the rivers are filling up with, with mud, with silt, with uh, uh, plants, uh, trees, stones and so forth and all of this then clogs up the rivers and it flows downstream. And that ends up in places like Bangladesh and in India and Nepal and so forth. So it, they're creating tremendous environmental problems and it, there's very little sense of the flow-on effects from what they're doing. Even the mining that's taking place is done in a very unsustainable, unsustainable way. A lot of chemicals are used, toxic chemicals are used. So the rivers are polluted, air is polluted, and strange kinds of disease are spreading in remote places of Tibet. So it's all documented. And also the cutting down of trees. So at one time it was so rampant uh, that, you know, it was like a clear cut mm -hmm. of the mountains. Now what happens is that when you uh, cut all the trees, when there's rain, obviously there will be land landslide. So the landslides, it goes down to the river, and hence the bed of the river is filled with stones and the mud, and hence the silting takes place. So as, you, as the river goes downstream, there's a flood. So that's a natural consequence. So some of the floods that's taking place in downstream area 
of including in Bangladesh and um, other areas uh, because of the deforestation taking place in Tibetan areas. That's true. And another big problem is the creation of dams. Uh, the Chinese government is planning to build literally hundreds of dams on the major rivers like the Yarlung Songbo. And uh, this is, uh, the, the UN's Commission on Dams recently released a report that concluded that the net benefit for uh, a dam is zero because of the environmental degradation, the environmental problems it causes and so forth. But the Chinese government is, is building hundreds of these and these also lead to creation of, of greater silt problems. They affect, affect the fish stocks and they affect the people downstream. And the Chinese government has really not done much in terms of studying the flow-on effects from the building of these dams. Um, that's true. The, you know, some rivers have up to 20 dams. So the Chinese company, they want to come and make money. And uh, I know it harms the environment and the livelihood of the Tibetan people uh, later. The biggest fear is, as I said, there is already a scarcity of fresh water in Asia. The big fear is that Chinese government will divert these rivers instead of flowing to India and Bangladesh and Southeast Asia towards China. Because China is already, when you have 400 million people, Chinese, facing water scarcity already, what would you do? So you would divert these rivers. Now, if you divert these rivers, what would all the neighboring countries will feel and how will they behave? It's almost like, you know, we all live in a community, so you all have neighbors. If you take all your neighbor's pipe and divert it to your home and deprive all your neighbors of water, I'm pretty sure by midnight they'll come outside your door and at least they'll make noises. <laughs> uh, so what would all these countries do? So this is the reality we are facing. And some people say, you know, also that uh, uh, water is white gold. Uh, because before, wars were fought over land. Nowadays, wars are fought over oil. Hence, that's why Middle East, there's a lot of problem. Soon, wars will be fought over water. And if that happens, and Tibet is the water tower of Asia. And uh, hence, for centuries, Tibetan respected, as far as our Buddhist norms and principles, the natural flow of rivers, and we shared our water with all the neighboring countries for free. Nowadays, you have to pay for water. Now, had we charged all the rivers with the neighboring countries, I think we, we could have been one of the richest country uh, in the world. I think per, per capita would have been very high. It's true. But you know, you're a professor of Buddhism. We practice Buddhism, so we were very generous. Uh, but uh, when our country was invaded and occupied in 1950s and 60s, our neighbors did not reciprocate that generosity back to us by supporting us. But now, with the expansionist design of China, that's from East China Sea to South China Sea to Scarborough Island, Doklam area in India and Bhutan now, all the neighboring countries are saying, what's happening? What is this China? We've been telling you for 60 years, it happened to us, it could happen to you. So in 1950s and 60s, you said, good luck to you, so sad to know what has happened to you but it's not going to happen to us. Now it's happening around the world, and they are saying, what's going on? So we told you for 60 years, and now I think people are waking up, but 60 years, a little late, but better to be late than never. So still there's time to support Tibet and Tibetan people for our, for our collective's sake. And, and this is an important point that you're making too, that what the Tibetan people are asking for is uh, actually, uh, things that are already in the Chinese constitution. That is, the right of self-determination in, in an area in which a particular minority is the majority is something that's enshrined in the Chinese constitution. Uh, I knew your predecessor quite well, Sondang mm -hmm. uh, Rinpoche. Yes. Uh, my first experience in India was uh, spending time at the Central University in Sarna, and we used to have tea very often at, in the evening. And he used to talk about these sorts of things. Um, that uh, what the Tibetans were, were really asking for is simply to be able to live their lives, to protect their culture, to practice their religion. And these are things that are actually in the Chinese constitution. The Chinese constitution offers these sorts of rights. So what the, Chinese, what the Tibetans are asking for is not something that is extraordinary, it's not something the Chinese really should have a problem with, because they actually, in their constitution, guarantee these things. 
But you know more about this than I do. Um, <laughs> I think the, uh, my predecessor, Samdhuru Mitche, was uh, and still is a great scholar, scholar of Buddhism and Sanskrit. And uh, so, ha you know, ha do you having known him is special. So as far as uh, Tibetans are concerned, as per the vision of His Holiness Dalai Lama, what we propose is a middle way approach, which is to seek genuine autonomy for the Tibetan people as per Chinese laws. So as far as history of Tibet is concerned, Tibet was an independent country. There is no dispute about that because even Chinese historians agree that Tibet was an independent country. So presently Tibet is under occupation and there is repression going on. So political repression, environmental destruction, cultural assimilation, social discrimination, all these are taking place. So hence, to elevate the sufferings of Tibetan people, what we propose is Tibetans be granted genuine autonomy as per Chinese laws and as per the Chinese constitution, which is very reasonable because China says that sovereignty and territorial integrity of China cannot be compromised. One China is non-negotiable. So in Solonis Dalam, Tibetan people, what we say is we agree with that. Give us genuine autonomy as per your laws. And we could take that as, you know, a uh, middle way approach. So we are as reasonable as possible. Uh, so whole world thinks this is a wise, win-win proposition. It's only a few Chinese leaders are yet to get the message. I hope you all will convince them when they come here. There was one time I was at a roundtable discussion um, about Tibet and about the Tibet situation, and one of the leading speakers was an economist, and somebody asked him what he thought it would take to change China's mind about Tibet, and his, his response was somebody with a calculator. Uh, and what he, the way he explained this was that Tibet is actually costing China an enormous amount of money every year, because in order to maintain the repression of Tibet, they have to station soldiers there. They they've built a major railroad there. They built highways there. Uh, Tibet can't sustain the soldiers that are being stationed there, so it costs them an enormous amount of money to. Uh, supply them with food, to create barracks for them, to move them back and forth and so forth. And just to retain, to, re to retain the sort of oppression they're doing is enormously costly. And yes, they do get some natural resources, yes, they get water and so forth, but the overall economic costs are far greater than what they get from Tibet. And so if they were to actually go along with the proposal that His Holiness has made for genuine autonomy, the middle way approach, they would be able to have far fewer soldiers there, they would be able to uh, save themselves an enormous amount of money, and they could pacify a rest of region because when, when you talk to Tibetans, the thing that comes up over and over again is that we just really want to be left alone to practice our culture, to speak our language, to practice our religion. We want His Holiness to come back to Tibet. Um, they're not really asking for very much. And if they were to do this, the Chinese government could save themselves an enormous amount of money and trouble, and they could also improve their international standing. Uh, you're right. It costs the Chinese government quite a lot on their hard power, but also on soft power. Because China has uh, the economy, the military power, but they want to be superpower. But to be superpower, you, know, you need respect, you need credibility. Um, that, I think, the Chinese government is yet to get. Because people point out to Tibet and say, what about respecting Tibetan people? Unless you respect Tibetan people, you are not going to get respect from the international community. And unless you respect basic freedom and human rights of the Tibetan people, we doubt or we suspect your credibility. Hence, you know, China, if they want to be a great power, credibility and respect are very, very important. And you can only get credibility by being sincere to Tibetan people because Chinese law says genuine autonomy is allowed, but there is no implementation. And until you implement your own laws, you won't get credibility. And they say that uh, they, they, re they refer to central Tibet as the Tibet Autonomous Region, but there has never actually been a Tibetan who had any real power in the Tibet Autonomous Region or in any of the other prefectures. There are, there are always Han Chinese who are actually in charge. The Communist Party leader is, is always a non-Tibetan. So Tibetans are not in charge of their own destinies. And that's a very good point. The most powerful person, I think, in Australian context is Premier of the province. In uh, Tibet Autonomous Region, it will be party secretary. Now, the party secretary has never been a Tibetan. The governor 
are Tibetans. The governor is just a rubber stamp. Not just that, in the what they call standing Politburo, a standing committee Politburo have, I don't know this year, but normally if they have 13 members in the top echelon of you know, um, ruling ladder, of the 13, first of all, seven are Chinese, or half Chinese, or married to Chinese. That's how they measure your loyalty. So then only few Tibetans are there. So not just the party secretary, even the top ruling elite. And uh, Tibetans are always the deputy party secretary, and you are deputy to the secretary. Uh, and the most high profile portfolios are always handled by Chinese. The planning commission is most powerful, finance commission is most powerful, all handled by Chinese. So Tibetans get like Tibetan culture portfolio, things like that. So even at that ladder, you will see, unless you are married to a Chinese or a half Chinese or full Chinese, you don't get any power. So you know, Tibetans in Tibet, even there are Communist Party members, they have dedicated 20, 30, 40 years of their life. They are a party member. They see themselves climbing the ladder but never reaching the top because Chinese simply don't trust Tibetans. So we never, in the last 60 years, even though the Chinese propaganda says Tibetans are master of their own region, and uh, they have converted Tibet into a socialist paradise, uh, but uh, Tibetans are yet to reach that paradise. And the other thing is that those who do become part of the Chinese system really have to do this by giving up their Tibetan identity. Uh, one of the best films that I've seen uh, is a film called Kigen. Mm. Kigen? Uh, yes. uh, it, literally, Old Dog. And it's about, well, the, the central figure is, is a, a Tibetan mastiff, but it looks at, at several Tibetans and how, how they responded to the Chinese state. So one is a woman who has become a, a policewoman in the local township, and her brother still is living a nomadic lifestyle, but he doesn't have a place. He, he can't sort of situate himself as a Tibetan man in this Chinese controlled environment. And the whole movie is really about dislocation. Mm -hmm. That is, in order, to be, in order to become part of the Chinese system, you need to give up your Tibetan identity. Um, that's true. It reminded me of a couple of points. One, young children at the age of 12 or 13 or 14, the best and the brightest from Tibet are taken to inner China, to Shanghai and Beijing and other cities, and they're educated in special designated schools for Tibetan children. So there is a documentary which has come out by American journalist, American Chinese journalist. She did a video and it's been shown. And in that video, it's very clear. So the Chinese teachers who are there essentially confesses. They say, yes, we are here to indoctrinate them, make them into Chinese, make them believe in Chinese government. So the whole video says that. But there's one line, a group of you know, girls are asked this question. What do you think of all these things? You all are here, the school, all that. She said, yeah, we know very well why they brought us here. They are trying to make us red. They are trying to make us atheists. That's the reason why I will never be a Communist Party member. And all the girls surrounding us start giggling, laughing. <laughs> they say, for saying that she will be in deep trouble and everybody bursts into laughter. Even at, at the age of 12, 13, 12 and 13 and 14, they are taken from, in, from Tibet to inner China, they are taken to Shanghai, and they are indoctrinated. Even while the indoctrination is taking place, the children are saying, yes, we'll get the education, but you will never become communist. And I'll never join Communist Party because I am a Tibetan, I believe in my Buddhist spirituality. Mm. So you know how strong uh, the Tibetan identity and Tibetan sense of patriotism is, I think, is revealed um, by uh, even young uh, children. Mm. So, you know, th they are trying. Uh, and then in the uh, Chinese leadership, uh, another thing is also, often we say this, if Chinese government, you know, whenever I speak or someone speak, the spokesman of Chinese foreign ministry scold us. For example, they call me, out and out splitters. Uh, at one time they called me terrorists, which, did not, which does not stick. And recently they said that 
I have done nothing good for Tibetan people in my lifetime, as though he has done something good for Tibetan people, you know. So that's how they label you. Uh, that's how they try to, uh, you know, uh, actually trick and indoctrinate and, uh, uh, Tibetan people. But yet the resilience of the Tibetan people, their sense of patriotism is very strong. And sadly, 149 Tibetans have burned themselves, uh, committed self-immolation. That shows how serious, grave and tragic the situation in Tibet is. Now we consistently and categorically discourage self-immolation and we have done so for the last many years. But still this year there were four uh, Tibetans who burned themselves. Uh, so the tragedy is still continuing and uh, uh, a Chinese government for the last 60 years have tried to indoctrinate Tibetans and uh, buy loyalty of uh, Tibetans who work for the Communist Party. So there's a half joke, half truth. Beijing calls Lhasa and says, talks to a, a loyal Tibetan Communist Party member and say, you know, how many people do we have in Tibet who are loyal to the Communist Party? And do you want an honest answer or not an honest answer? <laughs> the Beijing guy says, I want an honest answer. Well, we might have difficulty filling a telephone booth. <laughs> so even after 60 years, one thing that the Chinese government has not been able to do is, you know, really indoctrinate Tibetans into the Chinese uh, communist propaganda. And one evidence is very clear, you know, the middle way approach, uh, respect for His Holiness Dalai Lama, the highest ranking Tibetan person in the Communist Party, as I told you, will be Deputy, Deputy Secretary or Governor. Almost all of them, bearing few exceptions, the day they retire, they write letter to the Chinese leader, please talk to Dalai Lama if you want to solve the Tibet issue. I mean, you're a lifelong Communist Party member and you climb the highest rank, right? The day you retire, you're free to speak in your, what, what's in your mind. They write letters to Teng Xiaoping, to Cheng Zemin, Hu Jintao. You know, there's, there's compilation of let letters from top Tibetan Communist Party members saying, if you really want to solve the issue of Tibet, you better talk to Dalai Lama. He is the solution. So that shows that even a Tibetan who works for the Communist Party for 10, 20, 30 years, on the day of the retirement, he confesses and says the truth. It's really true. Uh, I've been struck. I've, I've had four trips to Tibet now. And one of the things that's really struck me is the pervasiveness and the persistent uh, resistance of the Tibetans. Uh, I found this particularly in eastern Tibet and the thing that was most salient, the, the most important characteristic I think, was the adherence to religion. Uh, when you travel around most of Tibet you see evidence of religiosity everywhere. I've never seen anything like it in any other country that I've traveled. And particularly in eastern Tibet I saw the, the hillsides are full of prayer flags. There are uh, stupas built up on the hillsides. There are decorations of religious themes all over the place. Uh, people are going in large numbers circumambulating religious sites. Uh, images of His Holiness are in almost every monastery. 90% uh, of the monasteries that I visited in eastern Tibet had an image of His Holiness. And I remarked to, it, to several people about how, how they were able to do this. And they said, well, for a while they came and they would take them away, but we had more in the back room. And so as soon as they left, we put another one up and they finally just gave up. Uh, but that, that sort of resistance was something that you see everywhere you go in Tibet. And that adherence to religion, that adherence to being Tibetan, is something that really holds the people together in a way that's truly remarkable. Yeah. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, we see a lot of uh, Geshe's and Rinpoche's uh, monks in this room. Uh, the story of Tibetan Buddhism, and you are also a professor, you please correct me if I'm wrong, will in some ways, you know, uh, give you some comfort and give you some, you know, um, what do you call, courage uh, and sense of optimism or hopefulness because this story will show, demonstrate the resilience of the Tibetan people, how determined and hardworking Tibetans are. Now, the, if you go back, Nalanda University in, Tibet, in, in, in India, from 2nd, 3rd, all the way to 13th century, 
was the greatest university in the whole world. From there, Buddhism spread all across the world. It was destroyed in 13th century. Thankfully for Tibetan Lhotsavas, the translators, they came from Tibet to India, learned Sanskrit in 7th and 8th century. Can you imagine? Right? They tracked the mountains. If 10 tried, 6 or 7, sometimes 8 died on the way, either eaten by animals, robbed by bandits, or just died because of the climate. So they crossed over the mountains and they came to India, learned Sanskrit, and translated all the Buddhist texts into Tibetan. The most comprehensive Buddhist text in the whole world is in Tibetan language, not in English, not in Chinese, not in Japanese, Kanjur, Tengur, whole volume. Can you imagine? Now, 13th century Mahavira, Nalanda Mahavira was destroyed in India. And then Tibet became a Buddhist country. But in 1950s and 60s, Chinese army, Red Army, came and destroyed 98% of monasteries and nunneries. 99.9% .9 of monks and nuns were disrobed. So Mao Zedong and Chinese leaders thought, we won. Look at Tibet. No monks, no nuns, no Buddhism, no temples, no monasteries. But His Holiness Dalai Lama and 80,000 Tibetan, some of the elder monks, came to exile in India, rebuilt monasteries, brick after brick, revived Buddhism. All the major monasteries were rebuilt in exile. And the Tibetans, we exiled Tibetans, kept and revived Buddhism. Not only that, His Holiness had plan B, revive Buddhism in the whole of Himalayan belt. That's northern India. The plan was, if situation becomes so bad in Tibet, they can cross over the mountains and revive Buddhism back in Tibet. And also revive Buddhism in all the Western world, including in Australia. That's plan C of Dalai Lama, you know. Because if they cannot cross the mountains, it's very, it's very risky. All the dharma centers will fly take Australian Airlines or Qantas Airlines and fly to Beijing, to Lhasa, revive Buddhism back in Tibet. And the plan D, revival of Buddhism in Tibet has worked. Buddhism is back in Tibet. After the Cultural Revolution, late 70s and 80s, first thing Tibetans in Tibet did was rebuild monasteries and nunneries. Now we know the case of Larunga, which is a tragedy, but also, you know, in some ways, positive sign. Larunga, till recently had 12,000 monks and nuns, of which two or 3,000 were Chinese. You had such a big monastery of 12,000 monks and nuns. Now it's a 12 months project, now Chinese are completing it. Now they have destroyed, they're destroying it and reducing it from 12,000 to 5,000 monks and nuns. Including Han Chinese monks and nuns are expelled. Yachengar, 5,000 nuns, they are also expelled. What it shows is that what they destroyed in 1950s and 60s, 98% destroyed, is revived and dynamic back in Tibet. So His Solonius had plan A, revival in exile, plan B, revival in Himalayan mountains, plan C, revival in the Western countries, plan D, revive back in Tibet, all has worked. And plan E has also worked, revival of Buddhism in China. China, oddly, is the largest Buddhist country in the world. 300 to 400 million Chinese are Buddhists. So there are more Buddhists than Communist Party members. So that's why they are, you know, Chinese leaders are a bit scared of His Holiness Dalai Lama because they have only 82 million members, whereas His Holiness could have 300 to 400 million members. So this story shows the resilience and the re determination of Tibetan people. You know, we are quite, you know, uh, kind of people but work very, very, very hard. The Nalanda Mahavira, which was destroyed in India with the vision of His Solomon's Dalai Lama, we have revived Nalanda tradition or Nalanda Buddhism back in India. So that's how, I, I don't want to use the word capable, that's how hardworking Tibetans are. Similarly, revival of Tibetan language, uh, Tibetan culture back in Tibet, it's a challenge. Constantly, there's a system imposed on them to discourage Tibetan language, Tibetan culture, and Tibetan Buddhism. But bottom up, the assertion of Tibetan identity and culture is going on. So partly, I must say, thanks to all our Australian friends and other friends who helped us 
revived this Buddhism in India, the monasteries and nunneries, which has made this possible. So I must take this opportunity to all of you who are in this room because of your generosity and support uh, for us, uh, we have managed to uh, survive, not just survive, thrive Buddhist civilization, Buddhist culture, and Tibetan identity. His Holiness has also had some in interesting influences on Western academia. My, the program that I were, where I got my PhD at the University of Virginia was actually instituted by him in conjunction with my PhD advisor, Jeffrey Hopkins. So His Holiness came before I went there and helped to establish this program in which we studied a modified version of the Gomang uh, curriculum. So we, we learned the traditional uh, debating system, we learned the definition of the Seni, and we actually debated with Tibetan geishas. And that program turned out quite a number of the people who are now in prominent positions teaching Buddhism around the world. Uh, so it's only this, this is maybe plan F, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> the final but, F, the yeah. final plan. Yes. And so, uh, and one of, one of my greatest experiences was at the end of the program, I had to do a comprehensive exam where uh, Gishu Pendendrakpa, one of the great scholars of our time, was our examiner. And we had to go through a traditional debate. And in the middle of it, and he was looking very stern at the end of it, uh, he sort of broke down and started crying. He was, he was hugging us and saying in Tibetan, you guys, I've heard other Westerners debate, but I've never heard anybody like you. This is really great. And he, was, and he sort of walked, ran out of the room crying because here he saw an example of people seriously studying the system and carrying it on in a way that was very, you know, that it really never happened before. Because here, here you had lay people debating uh, and learning the system in a way that in the past was only accessible to monks. That's true. Plan F is to uh, make serious scholars uh, like Professor here. If you go to University of Virginia, Columbia, you know, major universities around, around the world have Buddhist department now, and many of them are studying uh, Buddhism and teaching Buddhism in academic way. Yes. The plan G, <laughs> the good plan, His Holiness has taken uh, you know, one step ahead so he has divided the whole Kanjur Tengyur into whole Buddhism as Buddhist text into a Buddhism as a philosophy, a Buddhism as science, and Buddhism as religion. So he says this Buddhism as a religion is for Tibetan Buddhists, is none of the business of others, but Buddhism as science and Buddhism as philosophy. Where there's, in Buddhism there's a lot of issue about quantum physics is talked, discussed in the Buddhist text. And uh, Buddhism as science is about mindfulness, the study of mind. So a lot of neuroscientists, a lot of scientists are interested in studying about Buddhism. When I invited, you know, His Holiness, Harvard invited, but I was organizing it. Um, the, my partner the, who was uh, helping organize the conference was from uh, Harvard Health School. He was a psychiatrist. I was shocked that when he said in Western psychiatry, they talk about the, you know, depression and stress. It's something to do with your brain. The concept of mind is not there. The concept of mind is only there. Mind is what brain does. I said, no, there is a separate entity or factor called mind in Buddhism. Unless you understand how mind works, you won't understand your psychology. So what His Holiness brought to the world is study of mind. That's what he says. So Nalanda University discussed this 2,000, 2,500 years ago. Now the Western scientists and neuroscientists are discovering it. So hence he says, as far as psychology is concerned, Western scientists are kindergarten when it comes to Buddhist monks. <laughs> the one thing that's come up a few times, and I was wondering if you might talk a bit about this, is what's happening with the Tibetan language. Because we've talked a lot about Tibetan identity, and I really think that the language is probably the most important core identity for Tibetans, along with religion. And I think the two really go together. And I think it'd be it'd be useful to talk about what's happening with Tibetan language today. Uh, you know, Chinese government they have systematic plan to make Tibet into China and make Tibetans into Chinese. And how how can you make Tibetan people into Chinese? Is their first destroy the civilization, Buddhism, culture, and language. And uh, so in, you know, schools, middle school, high school, at the university level, 
Media web instruction in Tibet and Tibetan areas are Chinese. Media web instruction is not Tibetan. So I was told in Tibet University in Lhasa, they want to teach Tibetan history in Chinese language so that they can teach the Chinese version of Tibetan history. And if plan goes well, they want to teach astrology and astronomy also, uh, astrology uh, and Tibetan medicine also in Chinese. And one big plan that they have is project is to translate all the Buddhist texts in Chinese and hence they can teach everything in Chinese, thereby make Tibetans really like a Chinese uh, people or Chinese mindset. So that's their plan. So their plan is cultural assimilation, assimilate Tibetans into Chinese and make them Chinese. But I think, uh, you know, it will not work. That's what I feel, yes. It's not working very well so far. So far, if you look at the Cultural Revolution time when they actually destroyed everything, from there now, uh, Tibetans' resilience, uh, I think the bottom-up approach uh, is working and spreading. For example, Wednesday is celebrated as Lhakar, White Wednesday, where, you know, this concept that you should wear Tibetan, eat Tibetan, think Tibetan, do Tibetan is spreading uh, inside Tibet. And we also, outside, we try uh, to support that practice. And uh, like, you know, we have Australian Idol. Do you have American Idol or Australian Idol? In, in Tibet, this Tibetan Idol is whoever reads the Tibetan poetry or Tibetan poem or Tibetan scripture well, uh, and then they are given the award. So the Tibetan businessman gives a car or a motorbike, and this competition is whoever reads and writes Tibetan the best uh, gets the award. So it's all happening at the grassroots level. So hence, uh, Chinese government is trying the best, but I think we are pushing back. Mm. I, I saw that a lot, particularly in Eastern Tibet, the effect of, Hagar, of, of White Wednesdays. That, um, and the, the reason for this is that uh, Wednesday was, is, is the day that His Holiness was born. So anything that you do on a Wednesday is something that's particularly auspicious and uh, contributes to His Holiness's long life. And so one of the remarkable things is that practicing religion among Tibetans has become an act of resistance against the Chinese state. And it's very interesting to see how this happens, that uh, actually being Tibetan, uh, as you said, eating Tibetan, speaking Tibetan, wearing Tibetan clothing, has become an act of resistance. And it's, it's very powerful because you can um, say if you have a protest, you're going to get arrested, you're going to be tortured and so forth, but it's hard to, to arrest somebody for wearing a chuba or for speaking Tibetan, or for eating a momo. Uh, and so all of these things for Tibetans have become acts of resistance. And it's remarkable to see this, or circumambulating a stupa. Uh, and from the Chinese point of view, they can't really do much about this, because how do you know whether somebody is trying to contribute to His Holiness's long life, or they're on their way to work uh, when they're walking around a stupa? So it's, it's become, it's, it's a very interesting subversion of, uh, of Chinese norms and of Chinese laws. Being Tibetan is something that is actually contributing to resistance and giving Tibetans a sense of shared identity. The sense of Tibetan identity is very strong. In early 80s, uh, the Tibetan delegation from India uh, went to Tibet. Uh, Chinese leaders literally believed that Tibetans in Tibet have become more or less like Chinese and they will hate the exiled Tibetans. So the advisory note was, and the notices, the, you know, based on the walls was, when the exiled Tibetan delegation come, don't spit on them, don't throw stones on them, don't insult them. They're just coming to see the situation. When they actually landed in Tibet, Tibet, thousands of Tibetans mobbed them, you know, and they wanted to have piece of clothes because you are coming from India where Dalai Lama is living. So this is sacred, this is precious, this is blessing. Chinese got shock of their life. My goodness, after almost 30 years of propaganda and indoctrination, this is what we see, right? And I think it was in late 90s, there was a Kala Chakra in South India. And His Holiness appealed uh, to Tibetans in Tibet. Because we have the centuries-old custom of wearing animal fur, animal skin. 
you know, also part of a tiger or leopard skin as part of a tradition dress uh, that you see Tibetans wearing. Now he made the appeal, he said, tiger and leopard, they are endangered species. We should not do this anymore. This is like hundreds and hundreds of years old tradition. Huh? So within weeks, there were bonfire in Tibet. They burned all those skin, right? Tiger skin, leopard skin. And Chinese were surprised. So now if you go to Tibet, 90% of Tibetans don't wear animal fur skin. Now it's equivalent to in Australia and rest of the world. If a president or prime minister or king of that particular country tells his people, give up your Rolex watch and Gucci bag. <laughs> now how many Australian women will throw your Gucci bag and how many Australian men will burn your Omega watch because your leader tells you to so? Now, Tibetans in Tibet did. Now, if you go to Tibet, that animal skin is gone. 90% of it is gone. So that much of loyalty and faith and love of Tibetan people is towards His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So I can clearly see Reverend Bill Cruz is here. <laughs> so indication now we should, I think, uh, close it down. I think there's no, we're, we're more, more interesting performances coming. But in the end, I just want to say the Chinese leaders should clearly see His Holiness the Dalai Lama as the solution to the Tibet issue and not the problem. For the next 15 minutes, we're conducting a QA, and a and um, I'll hand my microphone over so that the, we can go around the room if anybody has any questions. I'll give you the microphone to take. There you go. Um, Dr. Sange, thank you very much for your talk this evening, your discussion. I'm sure everybody here agrees with everything you've said. And, and would also agree that what the Tibetans are asking for is very, very moderate. But what I'd like to ask you is how much realistic potential you see for political change in the next few years, given China's ever-rising political power and the fact that the US, for the moment, seems to have given up its role as the leaders of democracy and human rights in the world. Yes. Whenever I'm asked this kind of questions, with the word realistic. So I always say Tibetans, as Buddhists, we are perennially optimistic or hopeful. Um, and I do think, really, uh, things will change for the better. I do believe we will find the solution during His Holiness Dalai Lama's time and he will definitely return to Tibet. I do feel like that. Now, if you ask me why, if you ask me, point to some indications, I can't. But at the same time, I will point out to historical events where, for example, Nelson Mandela was in prison for 28 years and eight years in solitary confinement. If you read the news media of those days, obituaries were written about Nelson Mandela. He said, far from reviving democracy in South Africa, he won't be free himself. And I was just sharing a story. You know, I met a uh, Nobel Peace Laureate, a uh, former president of Poland, uh, Leo Wallace. Um, he told me a story. He said, uh, Chancellor and Foreign Minister of West Germany was visiting him. And he was asked by then Foreign Minister, what do you make of all the students and the youth surrounding the Berlin Wall? And he told him, he said, Berlin Wall is coming down, be prepared. Then Foreign Minister of West Germany said, I wish this problem will happen, but it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Two weeks later, Berlin Wall came down. Now, Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, another story also, and I have met Nobel Peace Laureate Ramos Horta of East Timor. He told me that he got an invitation from one state in Midwest of America. He changed three flights. And when he reached airport, he was driven by a person to a cafeteria. There were only six people waiting. Can he, he changed three flights. And he reached there, six people in the cafeteria wanting to know East Timor. We are your supporter. But I think I can clearly see there are more people than six in this room, right? So. So, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi, just next door, 
Who would have thought four years ago that she would be out of house arrest and she would walk the streets of Rangoon and become the most powerful leader of Burma? I think four years ago she was asked the same question. Realistically, do you think you will ever be freed from the house arrest? Do you, can, do you ever think that your party will win the election? So this question is being asked to all these great leaders and the history has proven that, you know, the arc of history is long but it bent towards justice and it will bend towards justice sooner than later. That's what I feel, yes. I know China is growing, its economy is growing, its military power is strong. But then, you know, I've been conveying this message to uh, people in Australia and also the leaders. This element of fear um, everywhere about China. And I said, you allow this fear to grow within you. Fear will come when you allow that fear to grow in you. So if you look at uh, it from a different angle, because as far as Tibetan is concerned, truth is on our side. Justice should be on our side. And, uh, you know, history, I think, is on our side. And we do think we will prevail. So we don't, I, you know, we, don't, we are not scared of Chinese government and its military power, economic power, really. Because why? When I say these people just smile and they don't believe. Because we have lived next to China for centuries. We know them so well. Genetically, we know each other pretty well. It's just that they have some money and some guns, so they are flexing their muscle. But we are Tibetans, eh? we know we are mountain people. We climb the mountains of Tibetan plateau, you know. We have the rugged determination, resilience on our side. And most importantly, Buddhism is on our side. That's all you need. Buddhism is 2,500 years old. Communism is 100 years old. It's a baby. There's no competition between the two. <laughs> Welcome to Melbourne, Dr. Sangay. I was also born in Darjeeling, so I feel much better. Oh. <laughs> um, my question relates to the um, position of the Tibetans in Tibet in terms of the workforce. I've also traveled in eastern Tibet recently, and uh, my observation is that the Tibetans are not only, they not only have no power in um, in Tibet, in terms of political power, they also are no part of the workforce. The Han Chinese yes. have moved in, mm. they have taken over basically all the businesses, they do all the buildings, so uh, there's certainly a lot of monasteries being built, but if you go and observe the people who are actually building them, they're either Han Chinese or Muslims. Uh, the Tibetans get no training. That's partly because there's no investment in their training. Um, what, what are your suggestions as to how their situation in the workforce could be improved? Is there a way of doing it from the outside with sort of external investment? Thank you. Uh, the population transfer policy of China is centuries old. Um, in Manchuria, I think there are nine Chinese per one Manchurian. Uh, in Inner Mongolia, I think there are eight Chinese per two Mongolians. In Xinjiang also now, some say it's 50%, I think it's close to 60% are Chinese population. So it's a centuries old practice of sending you know, Chinese people to different parts of the world, now including Africa, you know, they are going and in Australia also, I believe, there's more than a million Chinese. So this is a centuries-old practice. So in Tibet also, main reason why uh, you know, Chinese, many Chinese are there are mainly because of subsidies. Because if you go to Lhasa, the taxi license, the rickshaw license, restaurants, hotels, shops are owned or run by Chinese. 80, 85, if not 90 percent are owned or run by Chinese. Uh, and the workers are also Chinese. So there are no signboard now, there's blatant signboards. But the actual practice is, if you are Chinese, you are given 300 renminbi a day 
if you are Tibetan, they give you only 200 RMB a day. Now, how would you feel in, in here in Melbourne if there's signboards saying, if you're Chinese, we give you $300 a day, and if you're Australian, we give you $200 you know, a day. That blatant discrimination is going on. So this is an age-old practice. Uh, so, but uh, Tibet is protected and saved even after 60 years of occupation is by altitude and attitude. Because Tibetan plateau is so high, uh, Chinese can come, be there in urban areas, mainly in urban areas during summer. And they dominate the economy and tourism. But in winter, they have to go back. So in winter, Tibet is Tibetan majority. And attitude is Tibetan rugged determination and the mindset. They think this Tibet belongs to us. That mindset is there. So hence, they encourage inter, uh, you know, ethnic marriages. Subsidies are given if you marry a Chinese woman. All this policy and packages have been going on for many years. But still, very few Tibetans do marry Chinese. So hence, that Tibetan attitude is there. So that is saving us. So, you know, when they build hydropower dams, when they build mega buildings, they bring Chinese workers. But they come during summer and leave during winter. So we are not a big fan of global warming. The world should remain <laughs> cold for some time. That is one of the great defenses Tibet has, actually, is that the Chinese generally don't want to be there. They don't think of settling down in Tibet, so they usually come to Tibet to make money, and then they leave. Uh, so that it tends to be a transient population. The other thing that's interesting, uh, as you were saying, is that they, the Chinese are an urban population. They're an urban people. So when in the cities, it's overwhelmingly Chinese. The, the businesses are almost all Chinese. The signs are Chinese. But when you get outside of the cities, it's still ver Tibet is still Tibetan uh, in the countryside. Uh, and that's one of the things that the Chinese really don't like living in remote areas. And when they come to the cities, they try to transform them to be like what they left behind. Uh, so they set up karaoke bars and uh, Sichuan restaurants and things like that. But it's still never the same as China, so they really do want to go back at some point. Even the Chinese Communist Party officials, as far as number is concerned, it's the same. But they are given one promotion to go to Tibet, they are given another promotion after three years when they return. So because of double promotion and long vacation, anywhere from three months to six months, sometimes eight months vacation, um, you know, they go to Tibet. That's how they maintain the, their presence. Mm. In rural areas, you know, I read uh, the story. Uh, one Western anthropologist, sociologist, like professor here, uh, was in a village. And suddenly, you know, he hears loud radio noise. And then he says, oh, this is Voice of America from Washington, D.C. They're listening to radio from Voice of America. And he goes and says, could you tone it down? Are you not scared? You know, this is <laughs> dangerous. Because your next door neighbor is the local village communist party secretary. Are you not scared of him? He said, no, no, even he's listening. <laughs> So this is Tibetan way of resisting, you know. Even your local Communist Party official, you're listening. Also, I have another story of Larungar. Now it's being destroyed. So it reduced to 5,000. But there's another story, which is true. So Beijing issued a lot of notice to bring down the number of monks and nuns in Larungar. So finally, they sent notices to all the villages and told the village head to go to Larungar and bring their monks and nuns back home. So you take the notice sent, sent by central government, now your local office, you have to take the notice, and drives to Larungar and gets all the monks and nuns from his or her village and reads the notice. Now Beijing, the central government has instructed us to reduce the number of monks and nuns, and I'm personally here to convey the message to you. The notice says, now you all must return in three weeks' time, otherwise you'll be punished, you'll be reprimanded. Now, take photographs. So your photographs are taken, you're reading, all the gatherings are taking place. All done, done. Now, supplies from home. And new recruits, nuns and nuns from villages. <laughs> so, this is how Tibetans at local level resist. You know, so, there are 
part of the uh, Communist Party mechanism, but they are truly Tibetan in the in heart and mind. So no matter how many Chinese they bring, I think Tibetan altitude has saved us. And also, you know, this I read this recently. It's only 3,000 years or so ago we moved from 3,000 meters high of Tibetan plateau to 4,000 meters high because wheat can grow up to 3,000 meters. Then we discovered barley some 3,000 years ago, and then barley can withstand winter, and we climb 4,000 meters high. So even Tibetans mountain people climbed just 3,000 years ago, you saw, because we eat barley. Chinese will take hundreds and hundreds of years for them to be genetically adapted to live in the mountain tops of uh, Tibet. So good for global warming. It can <laughs> wait. Yeah. Uh, we have uh, someone with a beautiful chupa there. Oh, chupa 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 Yes. I always say uh, Tibetan women look good in chuba. So even Australian one. Yes. <laughs> it's very flattering. <laughs> First of all, I hope Melbourne has welcomed you. It's such a wonderful opportunity to have you speak and address us uh, as. Australian supporters of Tibet, Tibetan people and Tibetan culture, what can we do to further His Holiness Dalai Lama's middle way approach and for further your cause? Uh, first, you know, as Member of Parliament, Honourable Member of Parliament Michael Danby said, you should watch ABC uh, TV tomorrow uh, where you know, I spoke at National Press Club and uh, I also appeared on ABC TV last night. If you watch and spread that, you know, so I think growing awareness is very important. Um, and if you can join, uh, you know, any of the Tibetan organizations here, we have Melbourne has Tibetan community and our Tibetan information office uh, is in Canberra. If you are in the mailing list, um, then at least you will know what's going around. And I think, you know, it's time, maybe I can say this, I'm a middle way approach and non-violence, but I think we need to be a little louder. Uh, so, you know, talking to other Australian people and Chinese included about the issue of Tibet is very important. Um, I think calling news media, newspapers and television and all that, to so thank them if they cover something on Tibet and uh, to call them with a bit of a complaint if they don't cover it. Because you know, it's the news media is so partly business. How many people actually watch and read matters? And they will determine that when you call them, when you write to them. And if you just appreciate from far, without saying anything, news media will think, newspaper will think, oh, this news is not newsworthy because not many people are interested. So hence, every small thing that you can do, and you can thank, um, Honorable Michael Danby and other members of parliament who meet with us and uh, maybe nudge others who don't meet with us here. So I think first, get join one mailing list of Tibet Information Office or something so you are, you know, um, informed. And then uh, maybe go outside Chinese consulate or embassy and uh, show your presence in your beautiful chuba. Yeah. Social media too. Social media also, yeah. My question is, um, I went to Tibet last year in June uh, with my family. Uh, I took the kids and wife there. Um, they really enjoyed it. My question for you is, I can live in the Western world. I can go anytime there. Um, how are you feeling if I go, you can't go? Sort of uh, this sort of scenario. In terms of why I want to go back to Tibet is because my kids loved it, they enjoyed it. Um, I took them to India and I asked my 80 year old boy, I said, tell me what's the difference in monastery in Tibet and India? And he told me there's more rooms in Tibet in the monastery and also there's more steps and small, small things like that. He really enjoyed it. And also I took them to Western Tibet and see their grandparents 
So, yeah, I'm not sure how you feel it, I guess. Uh, you know, if you can go and meet your parents and grandparents, it's a good thing. First of all, your children should meet their grandparents and connect uh, with the family. Yep. Number two, it's very important for Tibetan children to know where they're coming from. Because I do remember asking recently uh, uh, Tibetan youth, I said, uh, you know, where are you originally from? Uh, he said, oh, I'm from uh, Toronto. I said, no, no, you are a Tibetan. I'm asking your, you know, birth. Oh, my father says uh, he's from Tibet. I said, which part of Tibet? Um, all I know is Tibet. So, I mean, that means, you know, there are a couple of steps or memories removed from where they are from. So it's very important for any child, Tibetan youth, to know where they're actually from. So to see the village, to uh, meet grandparents, is very important. Um, so that I was not allowed so far, uh, which is unfortunate, but also that gives me the resolve that I should fight for my right to visit. Now you are allowed, good thing, um, but I think if you try a couple of times, uh, I think the, you won't be allowed also. The, whether Chinese embassy allow you or not is determined by their discretion rather than your right. So there are many Tibetans in Australia who cannot go, who are not allowed to go. Not because they don't want to, but they are not allowed to. So we should always remember that discretion is there. It's arbitrary. They allow you, and one day they won't allow you. You can't say, I'm Tibetan, my grandparents are there, my parents are there. I know of many Tibetans whose parents died, and they were not allowed to visit their parents, even at the last stage. Um, hence, good, your you know, kids connected with grandparents and saw real Tibet, that memory should be cherished. Um, but then also be aware that Tibet is under occupation and there is repression going on and that totality of the situation uh, should uh, be known to your children as well. I think it's very important to go to Tibet, actually. Um, this is one of the things, when I, when I first went to India with my wife and we were, we were thinking of going there, uh, we decided initially not to because we didn't want to support Chinese suppression of Tibet. But I talked to Samdrung Rinpoche about this and then later to His Holiness, and they both said, no, you really should go because it's important that people go there, they see what's happening, and then they come back and talk about it. Uh, and actually being there, having first-hand information, first-hand observations, is, is something, there's really no substitute for that. And now that I'm somebody who teaches uh, about Tibet and I'm asked to uh, talk about it, say, in the news and so forth, actually going there, seeing it, and being able to say, this is what I saw, gives you a whole level of credibility that you don't have otherwise. So I think it is actually very important to go and to and report what you see. Actually, you know, even Australians, uh, anyone who wants to go to Tibet, we have nothing against anyone visiting Tibet. But we always say stay in Tibetan hotel, Tibetan own hotel, eat in Tibetan owned restaurants, uh, whether you like Tibetan tea or not, you will know then. And, you know, shown around by a Tibetan tour guide, then you will know something. Because I have met many Chinese. They say, oh, yes, I've been to Tibet. Um, but I, I asked some Tibetans there, and they have no complaints. And how come you are giving and saying all these things? When I went to Tibet, no one said anything. I said, do you realize that you look like the Chinese government official because you are Han Chinese, they are also Han Chinese? Oh, I never thought like that. And they stayed in Chinese-owned hotel. And I said, why? They travel agencies recommend that they stay in Chinese-owned hotel. Tibetan-owned hotel might be a little tricky. Um, and then they ate in Chinese restaurants. They're shown around by Chinese tour guide. And I said, why did you go to Tibet? Why don't you go to Shanghai then? No. Other than getting altitude sickness, you don't get to learn much. Had you stayed in Chinese hotel, Tibetan-owned hotel, maybe you will be a little nervous the first night, but that excitement is what tourist is, tourism is all about. If you eat Tibetan food, you may like or hate Tibetan butter tea, but that's the experience you're going there for. And if you listen to Tibetan tour guide telling you a little bit of contradictory narrative as far as Chinese government is concerned, that's what you are going there to learn. Um, hence, even Chinese tourists should go, but stay in Tibetan hotel, eat Tibetan restaurant, 
and uh, meet Tibetan nomads and go to Tibetan monasteries and, uh, you know, help local Tibetans. That's the key. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.